Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. It is 12 o'clock, so why don't we just say the Angelus while we, we start, huh? The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. For forth we beseech thee, O God, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, made by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord put it on my heart mm, sometime last year that the greatest sorrow of his heart and Our Lady in our times is the massacre of the Holy Innocents by way of abortion and for the desecration of the human body. Those are pretty heavy things. The whole abortion issue it pretty much speaks for itself. I'm in the second year of the Michigan Catholic um, Bible study, which has been a, a, a beautiful program. But one thing that I've been noticing throughout, um, throughout the scriptures, the, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament, is that history keeps repeating itself over and over and over. God appears to his people, he guides them, he feeds them, he guards them, and then the people get complacent. They want to kind of do their own thing. They want more, they want different, they want to follow other gods, they make golden calves, and so on and so forth. When we think about the heart of Christ, the heart of Jesus. We think about Jesus on the cross. We think about Jesus' resurrection. We think about Jesus' presence with us. We think about the holiness and the loveliness and the sacred heart of Our Lady, the immaculate heart of Our Lady. We can only imagine when the Lord would say something so deep as his greatest sorrow in our times is the massacre of the innocents, worse than in the time of abortion and the desecration of the human body. We think about how today's fashions are oftentimes very embarrassing. It's hard to find clothes, especially women's clothing, that fits appropriately, that's modest. Um, we think about all the ways the body can be desecrated the lack of respect for the temple, a body that is sacred to God. We've become over the years pretty um, indifferent. It's in your face everywhere you go. Summertime, people come to masses and stuff you'd wear to the beach almost. They wear to church. I remember sitting in a pew one time and the lector's dress was skirt was so short I could see way way I should not have seen what I saw let me just put it that way 
and I was scandalized. I mean, you know, uh, other times being on vacation, standing in line to get an ice cream or something, and I don't know where to put my eyes, you know. I can only imagine. I can only imagine the sorrow in the heart of Jesus. And when he, when he, when he spoke those words to me, it gave a whole new meaning. I mean, you hear all the time, we understand the abortion issue, and yet, and yet we know that it's not always the first thing on, on, on our mind when we make our decisions in life. There's no second issue to life. There's no second issue. There's, life doesn't take, come second to anything. Your life is no more important than the life in the womb of a mother. My life is no more important than the baby in the womb of its mother. We need to line up our thinking to have a full understanding of this. Life is life. It is sacred. It is given by God, and it should be taken by God. Never is it okay that life is less important than any other issue. If we get to a place where we don't respect the sanctity, the holiness, what God has brought together in a human life at any stage, I fear, I fear what will happen to us. I understand that a lot of the suffering that our world is going through in our times is because of the sin of abortion, either by committing it or not standing for the truth and supporting life. We know that, I've heard so many times people say, well, I personally wouldn't have an abortion, but I can't tell somebody else what to do. But what would your thinking be if that person were going to commit murder of the neighbor next door or a husband she was having trouble with or a lover? What would we say to that person? Just like, I wouldn't do that, but you go it's your life. We wouldn't. We would have to take action. When we think about the heart of Jesus in the heart of Mary, what Jesus sacrificed, what Mary sacrificed, you know, we can only imagine how such holiness could look down on this earth and think about the generations more than a generation that has been wiped out or we look they look down on the world and they see the desecration the lack of respect for the human body either for one's own body or towards another we know that pornography is one of the greatest atrocities of our times it's for men and women it's not just like a bad guy's thing to do Women are suffering from the same thing and, and right close to the same numbers. Pornography is no joke. It's a desecration. It's a lusting after the body. And it's a grievous sin against God because that's not how, who God made us to be. The human body is a beautiful thing to be loved, adored, honored, respected. So... I just feel so confirmed in, in, in the words of Christ. And I have to tell you, I was never one who actively worked in an, in an abortion movement or, or uh, anything, or, you know, life movement other than supporting the right to life or, um, you know, following in a march or something. But um, this is such an integral part of what our, our, our world needs to have understanding about that if we don't get it, if it doesn't become a number one issue in our life and in our decision making, there's going to be hell 
literally to pay for. We are going to suffer. This is nothing. This is nothing compared to what's ahead in our times. We know that we have a merciful God, hands down. And we know that when we sin, God in his mercy forgives us. There's forgiveness. The greater the sinner, the greater the mercy, Jesus told to St. Faustina. But once we know and we keep committing or omitting, you better think a hundred times because the sin of my brother or my sister or is a sin against me. We all suffer. We know that it was so critical in the time of Juan Diego that Our Lady appeared. When all of the, the, the sacrileges of the human lives being wasted, murdered, we've surpassed that. And we have a government that supports that thinking, not one that supports life. And so we have to really pray for our government. We really have to pray for these people for a conversion. Jesus' favorite prayer is for the conversion of sinners. That's divine mercy. We have to pray divine mercy for the conversion of these hearts and souls that are hardened to the atrocity and the sin of murder murdering of the unborn, murdering of the elderly, and the desecration, the disrespect of the human body. What God has brought together, no man should take away or take apart, or woman. Only God is God, and we are not. And so, Oftentimes, we hear things that maybe we don't want to hear. Maybe we don't understand. Maybe we don't like how it feels. Well, get over it. You have to stop at red lights when you go to drive down the street. You have to pay for a plane ticket. If you break the law, you go to jail. None of those things are, are fun or nice or anything easy to go through. But we just got to do it. Because in the Lord, yes, he's a merciful God, but he is a just God. And in God's way, there's a peaceful tranquility in the order of things. God wants things to be in order. It's not about our emotions and how we feel or we want to be nice and forgive and all of this. Of course we're called to forgive. Of course we're called to have mercy. Of course we're called to have kindness. But we are called to be a just people as well. To be a people of order. To be an obedient and honorable people. Sometimes these things, yeah, they rub us the wrong way. We just, you know, it pinches a little bit. But this is a great opportunity in the silence of our hearts to go before God and ask him to convict our hearts, to give us. And conviction by God is not, is not it doesn't, he doesn't break your spirit. He, he gives us life, light as to where we need to grow. Lord God, show me in your light the obstacles that separate me from you. You know, sometimes we are, we're not even really aware of it. And the Holy Spirit will give us that light. And even though there's forgiveness, there's, there's got to be atonement. So we're going to suffer for the sins. And we feel the repercussions of the sin of this world. If you think, I don't know what I'm talking about. I do. But as I was browsing through this... Um, Marion Helper Low Magazine that comes from Stockbridge, the uh, Divine Mercy Shrine. Father Seraphim, God rest his soul, who passed away recently, he was the postulator, um, the vice postulator for the canonization of St. Faustina, has written in his, this article how, um, 
how St. Faustina, when she burned her first diary because of the temptation of the devil that she was going through and him tempting her to say, who do you think you are? You're trying to be a saint or whatever. And so in that fear, she burnt it. The spiritual director was away. Only that when he came back to make her rewrite it, when she rewrote it, and according to the directive of Father Sapochko, her director at that time, he told her to leave out the details, but he knew them. And in this article by Father Seraphim, he wrote that in the 1930s, now this is when St. Faustina was given the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, and she, and this was on September 13th. She, she could see the just anger of, uh, the, of God coming through this, this angel, of, angel of death. He was coming to persecute Poland. He was coming to punish Poland. And she, the words that God gave her were the words of the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, to pray, to pray at that, at that time. Um, that she had seen that angel that was ready to chastise the world, uh, as Poland mainly. And in her prayer, the chaplet of divine mercy, it held back the, the arm of that angel from sending that punishment to, the, to, to Poland. The studies show, Father's, Father Michelenko said that in 1930s, it was discovered that Warsaw was the center of abortions. And this is the exact time when this was taking place. So believe, we believe it to be the reason there was supposed to be this chastisement on the city. The Lord then helped her to understand the purpose of these sufferings that she was going through was to make reparation to the Heavenly Father for the sins of abortion. So it's a, it continues to say, Father Seraphim said, when Father Sapachko went through her diary, he asked her for the reason exactly of this chastisement. She said, for the massacre of the innocents, not yet born. It's the most grievous crime of all. Now, that's a canonized saint. Those were her words. So again, as God comes to this world through this mission of mercy, he's enlightening his people. We want to know. Is that what we want to hear? No. We want to hear that it's something that we can easily fix and get it past us. That isn't the case. That's not the case. That's not where we're at in the world. This is what we're facing. And so we all have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility receiving the sacraments, living a godly life, to be a people of honor and order and obedience to the church, to God and to follow the way of the Lord. Thou shalt not kill. And to be people of honor. When we speak about the altar of suffering, we have set up a small altar over there. You'll see in the alcove of divine mercy before the Vilnius image. And what the Lord put on my heart for this land is for us in the quiet of our hearts with God to think about the things that we are really suffering with or struggling with. Maybe things that are obstacles that separate us in some way, even the slightest way, from God's love, from, from being perfect in God's love. You know, maybe it's an argument that you had with someone. Maybe it's a divorce that can't be changed. There's nothing you can do about it, whatever the case is. That separation, that hardship, those wounds. Maybe it's children that have left the church. Maybe it's just obstinate spirit that you can't just seem to work with. You just can't seem to get over and need help from God, his supernatural grace to help you to grow in that, uh, that mercy, that kindness in your heart, to give you the fortitude that you need and the prudence to continue to press on in order and in light and to live the right way, an honorable way. 
Maybe it's drinking. Maybe it's a bad mouth or gossip. Maybe it is porn. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's just nasty moods. Maybe it's an anger that we hold. Whatever it is, whatever our suffering is, lay it on the altar of suffering. Just go and lay it on the altar of suffering, spiritually and physically in that al in that alcove. We've made a beautiful little prayer card for you to write on the back, whatever it is. Nobody will see it. You write it. Write that obstacle, write that difficulty, that relationship, the illness, whatever it is that is, is causing you to continuously go in this cycle. Maybe things you can't get out of, or you're struggling to get out of, things you struggle with, things you confess over and over again. Beloved Jesus, beloved Jesus, beloved, Jesus says, my beloved, I, Jesus Christ, the teacher, am with you. I have heard you crying out, and this is my reply. Quiet and be at peace. Place your fears, worries, anxieties, your sorrows, your sicknesses, your loneliness, brokenness, at the altar of suffering and let go. Let me be God, Lord over all your concerns. Trust me. There's nothing to fear when we walk together. Only in darkness is there reason for fear. I am the light. Come to me and be comforted by my warmth, be at peace. There is no sin or obstacle or vice that is bigger than God. God can do anything. And God loves the impossible. Sometimes when we try to fix things, we make them worse. You just kind of go, keep going and just with all the best intentions, sometimes it just makes everything stinking worse. Give it up, surrender it, put it on the altar of suffering and let God be God, let God deal with the situation. Come to me, my sons and daughters, lay your anxieties at the altar of suffering. The path you travel, the sufferings you endure, the joys and the triumphs, all things I know. I knew them before you were conceived. Let my holy face be your constant encouragement. Listen to my call. Come, come unto me, come closer. Do not fear, my heart overflows with mercy and love for you, Jesus Christ. You'll find those messages in the book that I wrote, The Messages of Jesus. I want to leave you just with this one thing. No matter what hardship you have, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've done, anything, anything, there is nothing that God's mercy won't heal or can't heal. No matter what, God never gives up. We do, but he doesn't. Until you take your last breath, God will never give up. Jesus died for each one of us so that we may have life and we may have it in abundance. We are all called by God to be a light in this world. And sometimes because of ignorance, stupidity, sin, whatever the case may be, we fall. Don't stop there. God wants 
nothing more, no matter what, no matter what you've done. God wants nothing more than to restore you and get you back to the best possible place you could be. And believe me, I have seen the impossible, murderous situations, and have total, radical healing, conversion. So it ain't over yet. Just we have to stand our ground, we have to fight, we have to be a people of honor. I'll never forget that Divine Mercy Sunday when I heard Jesus say, we must be a people of honor. So we give it our best shot. We receive the sacrament of reconciliation. When we fall, God restores us. Yep, yep, we're going to have to make reparation, just like anything else. Your kid breaks the neighbor's window with the baseball. It's not enough to say you're sorry. The right thing to do is replace that window. It's the way it is, and that's how it should be, and that's how it is with God, so to speak. God bless all of us. God bless our families. And remember, in Jesus, the divine mercy, we always, hands down, we always have great, unfathomable hope. There's no reason for anxiety. There's no reason for depression because we have a God who is a merciful God, a just God, but a merciful God who has a forgiving heart. And because of what he did, what he shed for all of us, there's no, there's no darkness in the heart of Jesus Christ. Thing is, where there is light, that is Christ. There can be no darkness. So we just need to get into this, this time of Lent is a perfect time to get ship shape, do our very best, lay whatever it is that is causing you to either sin or suffer or be an obstacle, lay it in that altar of suffering. And when that's after Lent, we will take those and burn them and bury them. Um, well, as soon as we can, when the snow melts <laughs> uh, by Our Lady, uh, the crucified Christ um, in the garden. Okay, does anybody have any questions? I rarely ask that, but um, does anybody have anything on their heart? Do you need anything? You're in my prayers, and pray for me. God love you. God love you and your families. God bless all of us. Thank you. And now let us pray that chaplet of divine mercy with a real strong heart. God bless you.